Hi everybody, I'm Don Blastek, your Student Engagement Officer, and today I'm at Manningsgate Police Station with Jim and Katrina, who are both going to answer your questions which you've forwarded to me in your tutorial time. So first of all, Jim and Katrina are going to explain what their role is. Okay, um, afternoon everybody, Jim Baker, I'm the Police Superintendent, uh, responsible for the policing area of Telford and Rekin. So that's, I'm responsible for both the uniform and CID policing across the whole district. And my colleague? I'm Katrina Gilman, I'm the Equality and Diversity Advisor for uh, Telford and Shropshire. Uh, my role not only looks at making sure that the services that we offer to the public are accessible, but also uh, looking at hate crime and how we respond to hate crime and how we meet the needs of diverse communities. So the first question is from Freya from Public Uniform Services and the question is I'm in my first year level 3 PUS but I'm 18 in December and I have a full driving license. Will I be able to apply for the police doing the non-degree holder entry with only one year on the course or will I need to do the extended diploma? It's a great question um, from Freya. Yeah. Um, so the PCDA, which is the, the Constable Degree Entry Route, is a fantastic way now for young people and older people to come into the organisation and get a degree whilst they are learning to become police officers. And we're really hoping that that will extend the diversity of, the, of applicants to join us here in Telford and work here and get more people actually from the borough to better represent the community in policing Telford and, and the wider area. Um, in terms of the entry qualifications, you need to have 64 UCA points or UCAS points um, in order to, to join the, the PCDA programme. So I'm not sure at what point of your course that you would achieve the 64 points. I suspect you'd have to do the full qualification in order to hit the 64 points. Um, so my advice to you would be to, to once you started the course, continue it, finish it, and then um, do well, get distinctions, which is where I think where all the points are, and, um, and then we look forward to getting applications from you in terms of joining us. Fantastic background, fantastic grounding for you to become an officer. So finish the course, get the full 64 points, and then get that, get that application in. Okay, so the next question is from Connor from Media. He says, how many hate crimes have the police encountered in Shropshire in the last few years? Well, generally speaking, it's about 30 to 40 a month. We had, did see an increase in relation to um, uh, an increase in 2015 after the referendum result. Uh, sorry, 2016 referendum result. We did see an increase at that point. Uh, we've seen an increase and seen an increase sometimes when there is a national event. So if there is a, a, an event in relation to um, a terrorist incident, we can quite often see that some parts of our community are therefore attacked because of that, but generally, it's about one a day. Uh, one a day in Telford doesn't sound a lot, and realistically, we know quite often there's only scratching the surface. We know that although um, uh, statistics have changed somewhat, that generally speaking, two out of five people um, don't report a hate crime. Uh, that increases if you talk about sexual orientation, um, gender identity, and disability. Uh, generally they are lower reported. Uh, the, the disability population, generally say 80% of them, say that at some point they've received abuse and or what might warrant a crime, a disability hate crime or incident, throughout their life. But about one in ten of them report. Now although the disability and the number of disability offences is increasing, there's still a, a want for us to get much closer to the, to the mark of where we are. Um, it's important that we know where hate crime happens, even if our victims don't want anything done about it. So from our perspective, you know, your students are key. If they see something, if they see a hate crime, they're key to being able to report it to us. They don't have to be the victim. They don't even have to know the details of the people involved. But we can do nothing about something we know nothing about. So ultimately, it's getting that information in. So it's always underreported, and one of the things we always do is encourage as many people as possible to report hate crime, even if they themselves aren't the victim, or also maybe help the victim report it. Okay, so you kind of answered that in the first answer, but the second question from Connor was, which groups have been the target of hate crimes in Shropshire, and who was responsible for the said crimes and why? Okay, well it's hard to, to create a generic pattern of somebody who is a victim, and both somebody who is a perpetrator. Um, 
what, what I can say, we're in a period, as, as, as you know, and we're kind of speaking to you remotely, um, reference COVID restrictions. During the, the COVID uh, restrictions, we have seen um, lots more incidents involving neighbours, lots more incidents of a neighbour being um, verbally assaulted, physically assaulted or a property attack by another neighbour. Um, and, and some of that is about the fact that actually, if you think about it, people are spending far more time at home. They're actually probably more in contact with their neighbours than they ever have been. So if we look at current statistics, I'd say it's very much sits around neighbour dispute. Doesn't necessarily sit around any particular characteristic, although we always have more racially motivated offences reported to us than, um, than any other, and that's a national statistic um, as such. And perpetrators are anybody, and I, I think the, the reality is it's those individuals who believe that they have a right, not only when dealing with somebody and, and insulting them in some way, that they have to add something on that kind of attacks them because they're different. You know, if we deal with this at, at a level of children, we talk about it as bullying. And hate crime is kind of that bullying at an adult stage. It's that element of treating somebody differently just because they're different. So to some extent, I don't think you can say there are this kind of perpetrator and that there's this kind of suspect. Anybody can be a suspect and anybody can be a victim. The argument is, is about levels of intolerance and lots of hate crime victims we know they won't come to us the first few times it happens to them we know normally it's happened to them several times before they come back and we do unfortunately have some of our hate crime victims who say if I came to you every time somebody used an offensive term in relation to my race or religion or sexual orientation I'd be coming to you almost every day and that wouldn't be a great life for me so it's one of the reasons actually you know students and um, you are the individuals who will be going into the workplace but actually you have a great role to play in not tolerating it if the public don't tolerate it if the public are, um, are willing to report and willing to stand up it makes a huge difference for those for those victims okay so the next question is are video statements more valuable than written statements a bit more like katrina's answer there i think it depends on the, each case on its own merits so very often we can have a, a victim, and all victims are distressed by offences against them, but if a victim is particularly distressed, the ability to video that statement relieves some of the pressure and some of the heartache from the victim. Um, uh, but but it, in other ways, it elongates it because it's a longer process and the like. So it's very much on its own merits. It's very typical where we'd have a young person or a child as a victim we'd be looking to, to use video evidence because it reduces the burden on that young person, on that vulnerable victim, when they give evidence in court because we show the video. Okay, so the, the next question, why are so many sexual harassment cases closed after a month? It's interesting that that question is raised. Um, again, it's very difficult to comment in a generic way. Very often, if you think about the circumstances in which a, a sexual assault may take place, you may be in a situation where there is very little independent evidence of what has happened. You very often have the, the account given by the victim, and then often the offender, when identified, will give a, an account which is different. And then we have to approach the Crown Prosecution Service and ask them to make a judgment as to whether it passes what we call the evidential test and whether it passes the public interest test. Um, so very often when you have someone charged or suspected of a very serious sexual offence, very often it can come down to one person's word against another. And we have to look at the whole circumstances to support the version which we believe to be correct and put before the court for decision to be made. And that's one of the inherent problems with, with sexual assaults. Another question was, why do drug dealers sometimes get a longer prison sentence than people who commit serious sexual offences? The answer is legislature. It's law that's passed. So the reality is in relation to sentencing of our sentencing laws and sentencing powers is every single kind of criminal act has within it sentencing guidelines on how somebody who commits this offence, dependent upon circumstances and how, how they're dealt with. 
for me, the easiest one to refer to is kind of hate crime. Why is it somebody who verbally abuses somebody because of their race would get a tougher sentence than somebody who just verbally abuses somebody? And to some extent, in relation to that, it's done based upon harm. Mm. The harm to the victim is greater when they're picked on because they're different and there's nothing they can do about that difference. That's just who they are. However, um, if you look at the other offences, legislation drives what needs to happen. So I suppose, again, it's a kind of a, a call out to you. If you want to change the way sentencing works, the only way to do so is to change the powers that create that legislation and or change that legislation. But, but ultimately, um, you know, we are, we are, as the police as such, bound by whatever those, those judgments are. We, can't, we can make a case, and we will make a case, for why such harm is attracted. We will make a case with CPS on why we would want some gravity factors applied to certain cases. But ultimately, those sentencing rules are down to legislation. And there are many that, that, to be honest, don't seem in kilter with each other. But partly because they were all written at different periods of time. If you look at criminal acts and those that are current, some of them are really, really quite old. Mm. And another important point, I think, is about a drug dealer would be taking advantage of a lot of vulnerable people. Um, by doing that sort of thing. Yeah, they, they wouldn't, and it, there's, it, it's an element of harm, but if we talk about actual sentencing, mm -hmm. it, as in physical sentencing, it is down to that, that legislation. Mm -hmm. There is an argument also that anybody who's involved in drug dealing um, funds further criminality yeah. uh, in itself. Um, it pushes people into poverty, addiction does. It pushes them mm -hmm. into a critical crime like theft. Uh, ultimately, it has a societal impact in relation to people feeling safe in their areas. Um, it, it has a huge impact. So I think, you know, the idea that, um, that somebody who is dealing drugs is somehow committing less harm yeah. isn't necessarily the case. But you also have to look at the circumstance under which they're dealing those drugs. So we know that uh, across the country a big issue is in relation to what we call county lines which is ultimately kind of the exploitation of young people and vulnerable people, ultimately to, to deliver and deal drugs on behalf of large organised criminal gangs. And that has a significant impact on that, on that individual. And we have to sometimes take into account the duress that that person is placed under when, when mm. they're, they're forced into a scenario whereby actually they're too far down the line to come out of it and it makes it very difficult. But again, another thing is if you're worried about a friend who you think might be associating with somebody who you don't think is good for them or, or actually they're doing things for these so-called friends and they are so-called friends that, that you think isn't quite right, actually speak to your pastoral care at, at college. Uh, you can call us. Uh, you can call us anonymously as well. But just um, make sure that you kind of look out for each other as well. It's very easy for somebody to end up in a cycle of abuse that ultimately means they end up facing criminal prosecution. Um, we don't want that. We certainly don't want that for our, um, for any of our population, let alone um, uh, young people, because it ruins their futures. So ultimately, if you've got concern, if you have something you need to raise, then contact the pastoral care at, at, at college, but by all means also contact us and you can call Crime Stoppers here and you can leave no details. Okay, so the, why when asked um, do police sometimes refuse or avoid giving their name to people they are arresting? I mean, we have seen footage of that both nationally and locally um, and I, I'll be honest with you it makes me cringe when I see officers do that. Um, we are a public body, we should be accountable to the public that we serve. Um, we, do have, if people, we do have collar numbers as well so officers should provide their collar number at the very least in order to identify themselves when giving when searching people, the law actually says we should be identifying ourselves prior to, to doing the search. So on a very personal level, it makes me cringe, it's, it shouldn't be happening, and if I do see it, then we address it. So um, in short, it shouldn't be happening, and we need, if it does happen, at the very least, the column number should be given, but preferably the, the, the name of the officer involved, because we're here to serve you and serve the wider community. Okay, so the next question um, is, what is the process for becoming a crime investigator w within crimes or murder scenes? I, I, I'm making the, uh, making the assumption that the question was talking about forensic e examiner, um, I, because generically to be a police officer and to investigate, 
you join via the, the route we mentioned earlier, the, 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 the uh, PCDA route, which is the um, apprenticeship route. If you've already have a degree, you can join via something called a di diploma route. So if you have a degree in another subject, you can join and you get a diploma over two years, a postgraduate diploma, and become a cop. In terms of those colleagues that do forensic examination at scenes, the vast majority have got forensic science qualifications from a higher education establishment, and they are the colleagues, that, as and when jobs are advertised, that apply for those posts and get them. In more general terms, what we're seeing in, in the modern day is the, when you see a murder scene being investigated, it's about the physical recovery of evidence, blood, fingerprints, footprints, etc. In the modern world, our, for, our, di, our forensics is around digital media. So increasingly, most of our cases have a massive footprint in terms of digital media, either on social media, on video cameras, on phones. And so increasingly, we need to recruit people that have the skills and knowledge to get the evidence off digital media. Brilliant. Um, what regulations are set for the police to prevent excessive stop and searches? Okay, well, I, I think it's almost a, a dual answer um, in relation to this. From my perspective, um, one of the things we look at is stop and search. Uh, I look at stop and search with our independent advisory group, basically a group of volunteers that, that come in um, once a quarter or sometimes more often if we need them, but they will literally scrutinise the figures, including whether that's the use of it disproportionately. It, they also physically scrutinise um, random examples. So they will physically look at some random examples and be able to decide whether they think there's enough information, whether there's grounds for search. Part of our best use of, of stop and search powers is making sure that we're accountable to the public. So some of that is about that scrutiny. So uh, a, a plea to anybody who would want to be involved in that kind of scrutiny work is we will always be able to make room for you on Telford, um, Telford's local IAG. And if you're from the Shropshire area, Shropshire has their own IAG. So it would be really useful to have a young person's perspective on it. We do know we traditionally stop more young people than we do um, any other age range category. But what I'm fairly convinced of is we have quite a robust way now to challenge that. We also look at some of the body-worn video with those volunteers and they will look at a stop and search and whether they think everything was done as they would want it and expect it to be done. And any feedback in relation to that goes back to those supervisors, uh, a command team here and also the officers themselves, so that there can be learning involved in doing so. So the answer is I think we've got enough scrutiny to be able to make sure that we challenge it. But the other thing is if anybody is involved in a stop and search or sees a stop and search they're not happy with, then my answer to that is the only way we'll know about it is if you tell us. So report it to us. If you have a stop and search and you're not happy with how you're dealt with, then you have a formal route to make a complaint. If you feel it's necessary to do so, do so. And we will look at that case and that case would be investigated to make sure that we were doing everything that we should. And um, body-worn video is our best um, uh, uh, ally in relation to dealing with stop and search, which is the recording from body-worn video enables us to see both the demeanour of the officer mm. and the demeanour of the person being stopped. It also enables us to see the environment that person's in. So, you know, whether there's one police officer and quite a large crowd of people, or whether there is, there is four police officers and just one individual, and it enables us to, to, to look at, are we operating the best use of those stop-and-search powers? But we have to record on our system the legitimacy. We have mm. to record when we stop and search somebody, why we've done so, what we were looking for, and ultimately what the outcome is. A lawful, proportionate stop search is an a very powerful and effective tool to keep communities safe. And where it's done proportionately, legally and safely, communities support its use to keep the community safe. Um, and it, um, well, what we must do, as Katrina has described there, is be open and transparent about our processes so we have that community support so we can continue to deliver a very important policing tactic. Yeah, and also probably worth noting, although not going ahead during the COVID times, but will hopefully go ahead in the future, part of our best use of stop and search is what we call a ride-along. And members of the public can apply to 
go on a ride along whereby they may or may not witness a stop and search. But again, it's that level of scrutiny allowing the public to see quite clearly how we utilise the powers and how we treat individuals when we deal with them. Uh, so again, once that starts up again, in fact, Dan, I'll provide you with details when it does. Mm -hmm. It's um, it'll be great. It would be great. Generally speaking, the people who we've had on those ride-alongs tend to be older. It would be great to have some young people on ride-alongs. And, and also, you know, if they're thinking of a, a career in policing, whether that be as a police officer or a member of police staff, uh, nothing quite like having a ride around in the back of a cop car to um, have an idea of, of some of what we face on a daily basis, but also some of how we work with the community. Okay. Um, how much training is administered for de-escalation tactics? So, in terms of uh, police use of force is the terminology that we use. Um, clearly, we, we, we use something called the, the, the decision-making model, the national decision-making model. Um, and basically, what we have to be... The premise really is based on the fact that any use of force has to be proportionate, has to be legal, and it has to be the least force possible in order to achieve a lawful objective. And, and as the question says there, Dan, the very basic level of use of force is actual officer presence. So just by an officer being present at a scene or in company with someone will cause that person to behaviour to either de-escalate or to, unfortunately sometimes it can escalate. The next level up from just pure presence of an officer is something that we call tactical communications. So the best tool that any police officer has is his or her mouth and his or her ability to talk to people. And what we want from, from our officers and what we want from people that do, do join the police in, in the future is the ability to connect with people and communicate. Because if we can resolve a situation, if we can de-escalate through the use of tactical communications by de-escalating the situation, that's exactly what we want as well. But clearly there is a continuum of, of force that can be applied, but all officers are trained your first tool is be there, second tool, use this, and that's what we're trained to do. Have there ever been any excessive cases of racial profiling in our area? I mean, you, Katrina looks at the, at the data. Um, we are very, very wary about our use of stop search, about our use of force, and we always look at the demographics of the community that we're affected. In terms of our use of stop search in particular, um, we will focus and have an intelligence-led approach. So what do we mean by intelligence-led? So probably about 20 years ago now, the police service moved to a position where rather than just <laughs> behaving in a random fashion, we develop intelligence and information about criminality in our communities, and then we target our activity on those people that our intelligence and our community are telling us are committing criminality. Sometimes that criminality and that information will be referenced to particular individuals from particular groups in society. The vast majority of those groups are law-abiding individuals that go about their daily business as the wider community does. But sometimes some groups are made up from certain demographic groups. So on occasion we might have an operation where we're looking to stop that group from operating so they will come into contact with police more often, and because actually, in terms of demography, the white population of Telford is far bigger than the black British community, or the British Asian community, or the British Chinese community, we get into this confusion where proportionality gets spoke about. So because the white population is, is probably nine times or ten times as large as some of our more diverse communities, when we interact with a member from a diverse community, the, the disproportionality seems quite high. That's quite a complicated answer to give there, Dan, for, for okay. colleagues. But we do monitor it closely. At times, there will be a disproportionality because we're targeting our activity. And it just so happens, by targeting the activity, we are then in, actually engaging with a different demographic group rather than the majority group. Yeah, and our IOGs, again, scrutinise that, those independent advisors scrutinise that information, including disproportionality, and they will ask questions if they believe that a certain area has been targeted, and we will physically look then at, at providing them with the 
an evidence-based approach on why we've made those stop searches. If we don't feel that there's enough information in relation to some of them, again, that feedback will be given. Um, so what's important is that level of scrutiny and to be about, again, about being open and transparent. If we have suspect meets the description of the person and that description is based upon somebody's race or what they're wearing in relation to um, identifying them out on the street, the chances are if somebody else matching that description is out on the street, we're going to stop them. But if they match the description of a suspect who we need to stop because they've been a suspect and they've created a crime, then we're going to stop those people that match that description quite rightly. And actually one of the things our IAG say to us when they scrutinise that is, um, yeah, absolutely, if that person's been reported to have a knife, for example, I'd absolutely want you to stop somebody who matches that description because it is about keeping our community safe. Okay, so what did West Mercia Police make of the police brutality against ethnic mi minorities in America and what policies are in place to prevent this happening here? So we've touched on some of these elements already, or certainly Katrina has in terms of that scrutiny that we, we expose ourselves to by inviting members of the community to look at our body-worn video, to look at our stop search data, to look at our use of force data. As a senior manager here in Telford, I, on a monthly basis, I see officers' use of force in terms of how often they're using force, and it enables us to identify individuals that we think might require um, a closer inspection so that we can reassure ourselves that that force is being used appropriately. With the, the Black Lives Matter campaign through the summer, you saw the British police make very strong comments about the, the, the experience, the lived experience of um, black Americans in terms of the, the, the policing style. Um, the, it's, you know, it, it would be, you know, British policing has a, a complex relationship with its communities as well, but we strive to be as open and as transparent as possible. We continue in that journey, and we have our own issues locally in terms of ongoing court cases, which probably aren't appropriate to discuss here, but we recognise the issue, we recognise that we have to build trust and confidence in all elements of our community. We have to increase the representation of black British and black Asian and British Asian communities within our police and service here locally. We don't reflect our community effectively. We need more members of the community to come into the service so we better reflect the community that we serve. So we're on a journey. We have lots of processes and procedures in place. Um, I'm confident that the type of behaviour we've seen in America wouldn't be replicated here. We don't rest on our laurels. It's a journey, and we continue on that journey. Okay. We have um, different examples of hate crime, and there may be some people out there that are not aware that they're committing a crime by the language that they use or the behaviour, uh, their behaviour. So. There are examples of subcultures that can be targeted in terms of hate crime as well, isn't there? Yeah, so ultimately there are, there are um, varying categories based upon legislation that are covered under uh, hate crime. Uh, that's based upon race, religion, disability, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. But we do have a kind of more of a catch-all, which is something that was brought about by the Sophie Lancaster case. I'd encourage your students to look at that case. In fact, there's a really good film that you can that you can watch a documentary about um, how that individual lost their life due to hate, but not hate because of one of those five reasons, but hate because they were a goth and they looked visibly different. So we have, uh, and Sophie Lancaster's mum did a lot of work with uh, both governments and police forces on educating that those subcultures can be and can be discriminated against just as much, if not sometimes more, than some of those other. Um, categories. The idea that just because you wear a certain type of dress, have tattoos, don't have tattoos, have a certain hair colour, the idea that any of those things are part of your identity, but actually that you in some way, shape or form are verbally abused, physically abused, and or generally bullied about it, isn't okay. You know, I think the vast majority of people, um, and I would hope this for most of your students, the vast majority of people, um, don't leave the house in the morning to um, upset somebody. They don't leave the house in order to offend somebody. But at some point during the day, they might. Uh, what I'd say is, 
be affable to a challenge. I'm an equality and diversity advisor, and I don't always get it right, because I'm a human being, and sometimes I make error of judgment. But what I think is really important is our polite and, and, and robust challenge of that. So if somebody says to me, Katrina, I don't like it when you say, I'll say, oh, I'm really sorry, I don't suppose you mind me asking why, if I don't understand the reason why. And then say to them, OK, um, I, I, I get that, I'm really sorry that it caused you any offence and, and that I get to learn a lesson. Um, I think that's the vast majority of cases. When you look at the issues in relation to the Sophie Lancaster case, these people were intent upon picking on somebody who was different and they weren't just intent upon picking on them, they were intent upon beating them. Uh, ultimately, none of, that's, none of that's acceptable and anybody who thinks that that's acceptable behaviour um, will we'll come against us and up against us in varying circumstances. Alternative lifestyle and subculture can be more than just um, what people look like. It can be about what, the way people live their lives and choose to live their lives. It's just important to know that if you think you're being targeted because of a specific difference, that report it to us. In fact, the reality is, don't worry about whether it's a crime or not. Don't worry about whether it's an incident or not. Don't, don't worry about the merits of it. Don't worry about your proof. But tell us, we can do nothing about something we know nothing about. So please, tell us. Tell if it's a, it as if that happens to you. And if you don't want to give us your details, you can go online at reportit.org.uk and you can report it anonymously. You don't have to give us any details. But at least we'll know, and that will appear on some of our statistics, and some of those statistics and patterns of behaviour enable us to have intelligence-led policing to try and prevent the commission of those offences. If somebody was to say a homophobic slur on social media or in person, would that carry the same penalty as a racist slur in terminology? Technically, the legislation is slightly different because um, the, you get what's called a racially aggravated offence. And the hate crime element in relation to sexual orientation is really part of what's called gravity factors in relation to sentencing. So ultimately, dependent upon, and it's not just dependent upon what they say, it's very much dependent upon who the suspect is and the circumstances under which it occurs. So for example, if this suspect is somebody who never come to our attention before and ultimately um, knows the individual in question, and it might be that the, our victim wants to report it, but they don't actually want this person to hold over the court, but they do want them to stop that behaviour what victims tell us most what they want is it to stop who wouldn't who hasn't been bullied at some point in their life and doesn't want it to stop so ultimately i think it would very much depend upon the circumstances therefore of the suspect however if it's somebody who had been a perpetrator of hate crime offenses or lots of other offenses they would probably get a higher sentence based upon offending history even more than the gravity factors whether it would be racial or not there is still uh, an opportunity, I think, legislatively to bring them all into line and mean that everything would be classed as a hate-aggravated offence rather than the separate categories that we have. Um, because quite often as well, people aren't just one thing or another. They fit into... Everybody likes to fit you into a nice, neat little box, but most of us don't fit into the one. Um, and, and the reality is, is that quite often somebody can be attacked based upon multiple differences rather than just an individual difference. So, um, again, for me, uh, uh, looking at future legislation, and I know there's conversations in the uh, Home Office about it, it's looking at legislation that would enable those hate-aggravated offences to all be kind of categorised within the same vein. And hopefully that would include that subculture, hate crime in it. And I know some other forces, for example, look at um, uh, gender-related hate crime. Um, specifically, they call it a misogynistic marker. Um, we're not we're not there in our organisation reference reference dealing with that, but again we're led by the police chief council and uh, various national protocols on on how that moves forward. But it's never moving goalpost. We've seen an increase um, in hate crime on social media over the last. Should we film that again? <laughs> We've seen an increase on social media with hate crime on, on platforms like Twitter where famous people have been abused, quite a lot of footballers. Um, what's the penalty for um, the repercussions for somebody if they sent somebody a hateful message, a racist one, through Twitter, a direct message? Does it come under the Communications Act and what will be the penalty for somebody? 
again, the penalty is more based upon the circumstances of the offence and our suspect rather than there is a set. There, are, there will be limits on penalties on, on specific offences, and I can honestly say I can't quote to you all of them, but I can tell you students that they can look them up. They look at the Malicious Communication Act, they can look at the sentencing structure for that and look at what it would look like. However, it's a bit like the aggravating factors and the gravity factors that would be applied. We'd have to look at the fact that if somebody carried out an offence in relation to use of social media against somebody because of their race, because of their religion, because of their sexual orientation, ultimately because of that difference, um, those gravity factors would be higher than somebody who didn't. But I suppose the, the biggest caveat out there is it's a criminal offence to send a message to anybody by any means, electronic or um, in person or in writing. It's an offence to do so knowing you will cause harassment, alarm and distress or knowing that you should know that that causes harassment and distress. Um, you know, one of my best examples in relation to use of social media is if you wouldn't say it next to your nan in a crowded supermarket, it probably doesn't belong on social media because it's probably quite a good test. If you wouldn't be willing to shout it stood next to your nan in a crowded shopping centre, then, then chances are you don't want lots of people to see this, therefore it doesn't belong on social media. In fact, it probably belongs and is better to stay in your head than ever even come out of your mouth. So ultimately, um, that would be, be my advice. But yeah, um, the penalty will very much rely upon the suspect. If a suspect carries out the same offence multiple times, the sentence will get stiffer. And also, if they did so against one individual in particular, we would actually start to look not just at malicious communications, but har harassment, and also the extra protections we can bring in for people who are harassed as well. How long would it stay on your criminal record if you did commit a, a crime, a hate crime, or any other crime, um, physical um, harassment like that? Would it be on there for life? Well, ultimately, an enhanced search would always find those offences. So anybody who would work with vulnerable people, anybody who would work um, in, in kind of a public or in relation to a trusting relationship, it would appear on their record forever. There is an extent to which some offences, when committed when younger, can be expunged at the point that the person reaches the age of 18. But normally those are offences as well that they committed when they were much younger. There was actually um, a very recent stated case where uh, a police service in the north of England was taken to the appeal court over the revelation of a previous conviction of a, of a person when they were 13 or 14 years of age. And the, 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 um, the uh, court upheld the right for the police to look at that conviction and because, because of the role that we do. So, yeah. as, as Katrina said, easiest answer, just don't do it. Yeah, walk away, <laughs> don't say it. If there's a voice inside your head that's saying something that shouldn't be said next to your nan, don't say it. Okay, so guys, at Telford College, if you witness a hate crime, um, somebody attacking you or one of your fellow students, you can report this to a member of staff or the Be Safe team. If students were out in the public, um, on public transport or in the street, they witness hate crime, what would be the first thing they should do? So if it's something that's happening now and somebody's at risk, you dial 999. No questions asked. You dial 999, you tell us what's happening, you tell us where you are or where the offence is. Uh, if it's something that you've seen, but actually it, the event has now passed, then you can contact us via 101 or our website, and you can report online on our website. Alternatively, there's a national reporting, which is reportit.org.uk, and that enables people to report on their online in their own time. Uh, it works off your mobile phone as much as it works off uh, an internet, so you can kind of report anytime, anywhere. We have Crime Stoppers that uh, also operate that will enable you to report it anonymously if you if you choose to do so. But but my position is is the reporting bit's the most important bit. I would hope that if you reported said things to the pastoral team or the team within college, that the college would share that information with us in policing if the victim allowed or if the victim wanted it anonymised then anonymously. Because what would it that would enable us to do is that rich picture is if we know it's happening, we can do something about it. If we don't, it becomes an impossible task. Okay, guys, I hope that answered all of your questions. We may do this again in the future. 
Is there any more questions from, from you guys today for the students? Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the opportunity to engage with the, the students. Uh, difficult times, as, as Katrina's already referenced. We'd love to have been there physically, and hopefully one day um, we can come and visit you in person and have, have these types of conversations. So thank you for your time, Dan. Yeah, thanks a lot.